Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and this is Chemistry Essentials video 34, which is on electrochemistry. In electrochemistry, what we're doing is generating current. We're actually generating moving electrons in a reaction, or we're requiring those. And so if you don't understand what a redox reaction is, you may want to look at that video. But a great example of electrochemistry could be a lemon battery. All we're doing is inserting two pieces of metal into the lemon, and we're going to generate voltage. Now, you'd have to hook it up to a pretty sensitive voltmeter to measure that voltage, but if we hook a number of lemon batteries up in series, we could actually light a little LED. And so electrochemistry is really the study of redox reactions, and we're separating the reduction and the oxidation portion in space or time. Now, when you do that properly, you've created something called an electrochemical cell. That cell could either be a galvanic cell. It's sometimes re also referred to as a voltaic cell. An example could be a battery, and that's going to generate current. Or we could have an electrolytic cell, and that's going to require current. An example could be a rechargeable battery. And so what we're doing, remember, is separating the reduction and the oxidation. In review, reduction is the gaining of electrons, and oxidation is the losing of those electrons. And what we're doing is tapping the flow of those electrons. Now the metal is either a cathode or an anode. And a quick way to remember that is that reduction always occurs at the cathode and oxidation at the anode. Or a better way to remember that is that the consonants R and C are going to pair, and the uh, vowels, the O and the A, are going to pair as well. And so what we can do is analyze this cell. We can break it down into its two half reactions. We could figure out the potential of those two half reactions and then simply add them together to figure out the standard potential. So how much energy that cell could produce or require if it's electrolytic. Now this would be at STP, standard temperature and pressure. And so if we have variance from that, then we could use Le Chatelier's principle to vary, or excuse me, qualitatively measure what's going on. We can also measure stoichiometry in a cell. So we could use Faraday's laws to qualitative measure that as well. And so let's start with a simple demonstration. Let's say we take zinc solid and we immerse it in a copper solution. What will happen over time is we're going to get a reaction. And what you're going to find is that zinc is going to start to become an ion dissolved in the solution, and the copper is going to start to form a solid. So you'll actually form this solid copper on the outside. And so that's a redox reaction. It's reduction, it's oxidation. There's electrons flowing there, but we're not tapping any of those electrons. And so this would be that whole redox reaction. Again, we have the zinc, which is losing those electrons, and the copper, which is gaining those electrons. And so if we break it down into its two half reactions, it's going to look like this. Oxidation is where the zinc is losing its electrons, and the copper is gaining those electrons. Those are the two parts. And so in a cell, what we try to do is separate those. But before I actually show you the cell, I want to talk about the reduction potential. In other words, that's the potential energy that can really be released in a reaction like this. And so the zinc being oxidized is like a waterfall. In other words, it has energy up here, and it's releasing that energy. And we could measure it as 0.76 volts. And so you could look up standard reduction potentials, and you'll find a list of these for a number of different reduction and oxidation reactions. Now the cool thing is if we run it in the other direction, then it would be negative 7.6 volts. In other words, it'd be like trying to move the water up again. It would re require that energy. So if we look at the reduction part, this copper uh, gaining of electrons, it's going to have a reduction potential, or an E naught, of 0.34 volts. Okay, now let's actually build that cell. Let's separate the reduction and the oxidation portion. And so over here we have the anode. That's going to be where that oxidation takes place, that oxidation of the zinc. And then we have the cathode, and they're each going to be in a different solution. So right here we've got copper metal in a copper uh, solution. And then over here we have zinc ions in a, a zinc, uh, or excuse me, zinc solid in a zinc solution. And if we just let it sit like this, nothing will happen. In other words, it's not going to generate any voltage if we had a little voltmeter here up at the top. And the reason why is that we haven't completed the circuit. And so to do that, we're actually going to have to add a salt bridge. A salt bridge is going to be filled lots of times with a gel. In this case, we've got sodium nitrate. And what it's going to do is it's going to allow the ions to actually flow. So once we've added the salt bridge, this thing's going to turn on. And electrons are going to flow from the anode to the cathode. In other words, the electrons that are being lost in this zinc metal as the zinc becomes a zinc ion are going to travel through the wire to the cathode 
where they're going to actually pick up those electrons. And so let's talk about what's going on over here on the anode. This zinc metal, this zinc solid, is actually moving off into an ion in the solution itself. As it does that, it's losing those electrons. And so it's also losing mass. In other words, this anode is going to lose mass over time. If we look over on the other side, the cathode is actually going to gain mass because that copper that's in solution is going to combine with those electrons that are coming over from the anode and it's going to form a copper metal. And so we can see that the voltage is 1.1 volts. How did I get that 1.1 volts? I simply added up the reduction potential of those two half reactions. Now, how long is this going to occur? It's going to occur until it reaches some kind of an equilibrium, and so it won't last forever. Now, there's a Nernst equation you could use to analyze what happens if it's not really at standard potential, but that's outside the level of AP chemistry. What you should really use is Le Chatelier's principle. So what would happen, for example, if we increase the amount of zinc on the solution that would slow this reaction or if we were to increase the amount of copper it's going to speed up this reaction what happens if we increase the temperature that's going to speed up the chemistry it's going to speed up this reaction and it's going to be quicker in other words we're going to generate more volts than we would if it was at a cold temperature and so you should qualitatively kind of understand how a chemical reaction or things that would affect a chemical reaction could convert to uh, things that would affect this cell now what's an electrolytic cell? It's really essentially the opposite of that. In this one what we're going to do is add current. In this case we're adding a battery on this side and we're actually going to cause electrons to flow. Great example of this could be electroplating when we're actually adding one metal to the other side. Another example could be rechargeable batteries. And so a, a rechargeable battery works as you hook it up to electricity and what it does is it acts as an electrolytic cell. It's going to store energy inside the cell. Now you unplug it from electricity and now it becomes a galvanic cell. It can actually release energy. And so we can also use Faraday's laws to really study stoichiometry. In other words, what's happening to changes in the mass. And there are two laws. The first one is an equivalence between electricity and the mass. In other words, the more electricity that we apply to a cell, it's directly related to the amount of mass that a cathode or an anode is going to gain or lose. We also have an equivalence in Faraday's second law to um, the mass loss is going to be equivalent to the equivalent weight of that cathode or anode. What does that mean? Well, if we have something like copper and silver as two of our um, electrodes, what we would find is that silver, since it has a higher molecular weight, is going to actually lose more mass over time. And so that shouldn't seem surprising if you're looking at it as the losing of atoms from either the anode or the cathode. And so you should have learned the following. Did you learn to analyze data from galvanic or electrolytic cells? In other words, can you identify what is the reduction part and what is the oxidation part? And then finally, could you apply half reactions? Again, we did that with reduction potential or Faraday's law to see what's going on in a cell. Well, if you did, you learned what I hoped you would learn, and I hope that was helpful.